Hi, welcome to another episode of Unstructured Unlocked. I'm co-host Chris Wells. I'm co-host Michelle Govea. And we're joined today by Tom Wild, CEO of Indico Data. Hey, Tom, how are you? Hey, great to join you guys today. Yeah, we're glad you're here. Um, this is my first time on the podcast with Tom. I think he's an old hat at this, but i um, excited to, to be chatting today, Tom. Yeah, absolutely. Tom is one of those rare people that seems to be comfortable in just about every situation. It's unflappable. Uh, <laughs> so, Tom, uh, as survival you know, technique, <laughs> <laughs> you, um, you've been on before, but why don't you give uh, a quick intro, tell people who you are, and then we'll jump in. Yeah, so uh, CEO of Indico Data, I've been the CEO for about six years now, um, joined the company at its very, very early stage, uh, met the founders who had created the the core uh, large language model technology as really a dorm room startup. Uh, you know, this is a, a company originally fueled on, on you know, pizza and, and late nights. Um, and I've kind of made a pattern of, of doing that in my career. So I've been in the enterprise software space for 25 years. And and the majority of, of uh, my experiences have been pairing with uh, young, often young, very talented, technically uh, founders who were looking for help on how to connect their disruption to a market opportunity. And then, of course, all the things that go with that sales, marketing, productization, you know, pricing, all of the things that you have to do to figure out how to deliver value to a customer, that, that sort of handshake in the middle. Yeah, doing this a while. You're clearly an adrenaline junkie. <laughs> <laughs> that that uh, is true. That is true. It's not yeah. not for the faint of heart. Faint of heart. Uh, today's topic. This this is a this is a special episode for a couple reasons. One, we don't normally talk about Indico on the podcast, and two, this is episode number twenty five of Unstructured Unlocked, which is a. Wow. Um, I thought I'd be dead long before this came to pass. So. Um, <laughs> So it's a special moment. So the, the topic at hand is uh, Everest Group's recent report. It's actually a dual report on intelligent document processing and unstructured document processing products. Um, and it's their 2023 peak matrix. Um, very exciting for us because of where, of where Indico landed on it. But I wonder, Tom, and actually, Michelle, I'm going to point this at you, too, because of your perspective in the VC, v, VC space. Why are these kinds of reports important? Um, buyers, startups, investors, why do people care? I mean, I think from, from a vendor perspective, um, they're absolutely critical in helping buyers feel that I, they have a more impartial source of, of information about the developments in the market. You know, analysts typically ter- serve you know, so two, two purposes. One is uh, to uh, predict where a particular market is going, what are the developments, what 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 buyers should pay attention to. That's sort of at the macro, independent of any individual vendor that often attempts to sort of understand major technology shifts. Obviously, we're in the midst of, of one of the biggest, you know, since maybe the smartphone or the browser uh, with GPT. And then secondly, you know, the, the activity of the vendors can be confusing and a bit bewildering for, for buyers a lot of times. So they serve to sort of create an impartial view um, of that. All that means is that um, the vendors view them as a critical place to, to get information in the hands of buyers um, because of that uh, perceived impartiality. Uh, and so as a vendor, we invest a lot of time in discussing with analysts both their view on where the market's going, that helps us learn, and also we educate uh, the analyst as to what customers and prospects are telling us and then intersect that all with, you know, the the R and D and the developments that that we're, uh, you know, working to put into the market. Yeah, and, and Chris, on to to add, so the second half of your question on on how is it helpful to the investor side or the the venture capital investor side? Um, these reports help us in in a few different ways. One. Um, if it's an area that we're building a thesis on or may have made an investment in, it helps us fully understand who the major players are there. So building out that competitive landscape, potentially understanding who are um, acquirers of some of the investments that that we've made, um, who else is you know participating in the space with types of partnerships or um, then it also gives us just more awareness to for helping us support our portfolio companies to say, you know, 
we're familiar with these solutions. We've heard of them as incumbent solutions with insurance carriers, for example, or this is the challenge that that we've heard our our partners face. Um, and when we can, you know, tie those those two things together between the names that we hear and what we're seeing in these reports. Um, it's also super helpful um, when we're when we're exploring a new investment opportunity or just trying to get smart in a space um, as a list of companies that we should reach out to just to, to become familiar with. So from a, like a sourcing perspective, um, they're really helpful for us too. So I, I understand the back and forth between the vendor and the analyst, right? There's sort of a symb- symbiosis there. Um, What's the sim- what's the symbiosis with the VC and uh, the analyst? Um, so, interesting question. Uh, it it depends on on the relationship, right? So, like from my own experience, we don't have one to one relationships or, or key partnerships with any of them, right? Like where we stand back and we don't we want to get we don't be tied to anybody. We want a full understanding of the space. Um, but it is helpful um, when we see these reports come out. Um, one to acknowledge you, you fully understood or grasp how we see the space, um, or it teaches us a, a different perspective on how buyers are potentially seeing the space or, or the industry, and so that informs us on um, how should we coach and manage our portfolio companies. How should we think about investing in the future? Um, is there a heavy leaning towards interest in early stage startups versus much later enterprise? Um, and how does that inform our investment thesis? Um, and often, you know, at conferences and things, we will connect with with these groups and and have these exchanges and these dialogues. And um, it, it's just, it's it's helpful for us to just continue our our understanding of the market at large. Great. Okay, that's helpful. Um, Tom, you mentioned that uh, buyers find the behavior of vendors sometimes bewildering. Could you unpack that a little bit? Yeah, I think that buyers initially have to go on uh, sort of external signals to to decide who to engage to evaluate, you know, for for a problem that they ha- are trying to solve, and and usually they're engaging through the vendor's marketing materials, and marketing can be anywhere from confusing to misleading, uh, depending on you know what what vendor and what segment. So that alone is not enough for them to really uh, decide who to proceed with. They're looking for somebody who is uh, dug a bit deeper as another cut at this, right? And so what they get with analysts, um, for for people who have been behind the scenes with these analyst reports, um, we as vendors have to fill out giant spreadsheets. And effectively, you're going through almost an RFP process. It is an RFI process, um, where you have to fill out extensive detail about your capabilities around each feature function, extensive financial, you know, historical information, number of employees, uh, a mix of employees. It's it's a pretty deep dive into into what the company's been doing. Uh, secondly, I think very valuably, the analysts also conduct extensive reference checks. That of course the customers will ultimately do too. But um, the analysts, you know, do that uh, sort of across the market. And you know, as as a vendor, you're required to supply a certain number of of customer references. So the analysts are trying to make it difficult for you to make false claims. Um, and to vet the strength of your claims from a marketing perspective and match those to what they see. Um, so, you know, I think that's why buyers see them as valuable if the if they perceive the analyst to be thorough and number two, and very importantly, impartial, right? So I think that there's a spectrum of analysts from what's called sort of pay to play analysts who will, who will help you write white papers and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with those those analyst mm-hmm. firms, it's just they're more explicitly oriented towards the vendor messaging to the other side of the equation, which is more the, the sort of Gartners and IDCs of the world who are, are quite specifically oriented towards the consumers of these technologies and and and, and are very, very passionate about being impartial. Uh, so at least that's been my experience. Yep. So I'm going to I'm going to plug for you, Tom, the, the blog post that you have out on on uh, Indico being named in this report and we'll spoiler alert, uh, as a leader <laughs> reference in the report. Um, but in that blog post, you mentioned third time's the charm. Can you talk a little bit about um, the process it took um, to get here or kind of what the experience has been leading up to um, Indico having such a great, you know, um, positioning in, in this year's report? I think it's a, a combination of a few things. So um, 
we always felt that we had a very strong vision as to where this market was going and, and what capabilities would be required. Um, that didn't mean we had all those capabilities at the time of the particular analyst ports going back, you know, two, three, four years. Uh, so that's one. Two is same with the customer proof points, right? We were we were gaining traction with customer proof points as we accelerated and grew and and began to uh, be able to demonstrate tangible ROI with these customers. That really helped. And then third, and we'll take a little bit of credit for this. Um, our ability to help the analysts understand where the market's going, how to shape the the narrative around market trends and and what's going to be important in the future. You know, I think we we've been leaders in that. Um, and I can tell you that we've had with with our analyst discussions uh, across all the firms, not not singling out any particular firm, um, some very heated discussions and 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 disagreements about uh, where the market is going. And out of those uh, sometimes tough conversations, you know, I think both of us got better clarity as to, uh, you know, where, uh, what were the the data points and evidence as to, you know, who who had the right view of of the future, which of course is, you know, uh, the most difficult thing to to try to sort out. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit. Well, actually, I want there are two follow up questions I want to ask. One, not every startup goes the analyst route, especially mm-hmm. early in their life. And I think that's true. I think that's been something that you've done in your career, if I'm not mistaken, or is this specifically you think because of the space Indicos in it's super important? I think it's a bit of both. Um, if you're an enterprise software player, I personally view that, you know, it's indispensable that um, I'd rather spend money and time on analyst relationships than, than say, you know, PR. I think it's, it's just, it's that valuable. Um, at Indico, I made the case to the, to our board of directors early on that I was going to overinvest um, in analyst uh, uh, relationships given the stage of our company. And I think it it it's really paid off. We were recognized as a Gartner Cool vendor when with our first uh, release of our of, of what is now our product, right? Our intelligent intake product. Um, that's not necessarily just because we invested as customers of the subscribers to these analysts uh, uh, research and access to the to the analysts for for advice. Um, but also because you don't have to be a subscriber to, to brief the analysts and, and to get in front of them. Um, in fact, very much they they want to talk to everybody, whether they're they're a subscriber or not. It's more a question of of time and focus, right? And 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 really taking the time to to spend with them and, and articulate the story. So yeah, I'm 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 a big believer. Even today, we have large competitors who clearly you know have a different perspective on on uh, investing in the analyst uh, channel. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, you talked about the tension and disagreement over the way the marketing was going. The market was going. Was there a specific technology or um, aspect of you know verticals that could be sold into? What was the source of that tension? I think it was more fundamental. It, it was really definitional. So um, the the analyst had a view that the the world. Let's use documents as as the case in point here because we're talking about intelligent document processing. Um, many analysts we talked to across the firms had really limited their thinking that documents are either structured or semi-structured. Uh, and the, the, the mistake that we saw in that is that um, there, there clearly to us was a third category. Now, perhaps it was left out of the discussion originally because nobody really had a solve for it, right? If you're talking about there's two there's two things to consider when you when you define unstructured. It's funny. I just had this conversation with a with a prospect yesterday. Um, there is the, an individual document which may appear to have some structure to it, right? There may be tables within it, as an example. And a lot of times, prospects will say to us, "Well, this is clearly a semi-structured document." And I'll say, "Okay, maybe." Um, now, tell me a bit about this type of document. Are all of these types of documents that you get from the outside world are they all laid out the same way? Oh no, they're they're totally different. Um, some have the table on page six, some have no table, some have this and that. I'll say, okay, so that also is a is a definition of unstructured, right? The, the, your ability to know ahead of time what you're going to get um, is part of the definition, and so that took a lot of convincing and, and education with the analyst to say this is what our customers are bringing us. You're missing a definition for this. How do you 
how do you answer that? How, how, you know, how is that missing from your definition? And so over time, you know, we had a lot of back and forth about that. And, and I think we got to a better place, which is, you know, fast forward to this year, why in this case, ever split their, their reports into two. Yep. I think it's interesting too, just from our conversations, Tom, that it, it's not like they were missing a small sliver of the overall documents that were being taken in, right? It's it's the majority is unstructured. So it, it feels like they finally caught up to, at least in, from the insurance standpoint, is is the major pain point that that these solutions should be trying to solve for. Um, but you, you you just hit on a, another point. So in this year's report, um, they, they do break it up into two t- different categories, right? As you said, intelligent document processing and then unstructured document processing. What do you think is the nuance there? Um, I know you just talked about they were missing yeah. that whole category, but but from the vendors that they speak to, the way that they scored them, like what do you think is are the the key distinctions that that they picked up on um, as part of that report? Yeah, and it's an important point to make is like in their defense, at the time, ninety nine percent of the vendors they were evaluating could only handle structured or semi structured document types, right? So their worldview was. That's the world, right? And and that's understandable. When we showed up, we were the first to be able to assert that we truly could handle unstructured. And <clears throat> I think initially they were skeptical and and sort of didn't know what to do with us because um, there just hadn't been anyone who who could truly solve that. And as we started to bring them customer case studies and proof points, as we started to to really take them through our technology stack, um, remember this is long before. GPT broke onto the scene, right? So we were describing this large language model approach with transfer learning and deep learning. And this is at the dawn of those technologies, at least from a commercial standpoint. They didn't know quite what to, to, to where to put us, I should say. They they understood what we were doing and, and definitely appreciated the strengths of it, but didn't quite know how to, how to uh, articulate it into the overall market map. Um, so I think that was that was the big issue at the time. Now, fast forward where clearly large language models are the solution for things like intelligent document processing, conversational AI, you know, a whole whole host of categories, right? And we, and we haven't, aren't even touching on things like audio and video and image and all the things that, that generative AI is really good at. That's a sort of, you know, mostly outside of, of what we focus on. Um, there's a, a, a general acknowledgement that this is the right way to do that, you know, and everything that came before it, rules, templates, you know, regex um, has, has, is no longer the, the, the best uh, tool in the kit to solve these problems. Um, and so that's, I think, caused this moment in time where they decided, okay, we really have to talk about this separately um, because while all those old approaches work for structured and semi-structured, they do not work for unstructured. What's that future look like? Interesting. Um one thing that stood out to me on these peak matrix reports, uh, both of them, is the company that Indico is keeping. <laughs> we are in that quadrant with some massive companies, household names. Yeah, what do you, I'm actually interested in both of your takes on this. Like, what do you make of that? Michelle, I'll let you go first on that one. Good question. Um, I, I think it just points to the progress that Indico has made since since the early days of of really establishing itself to clearly articulate what the technology that Indico has developed can do, but also what we've talked about a ton of times on this podcast, Chris, is the business outcomes that it's driving, right? Indico um, is is multi-industry. Um, I, I'm particularly a fan of how strong it is in the insurance vertical um, coming from, from our background and just the, you know, the, I'll call it the, the progression that's been made even just within that sector of being able to understand the customer, um, having having a core solution, but that's also customizable um, depending on the size and scale of the customer, but also the industry, um, and probably how nimble and quick and flexible an Indico can be against these very large incumbent players that are probably locked a little bit more in some internal legacy or um, you know processes and protocols that that work for them, but they are much larger enterprises that typically tends to, to slow them down. And when you've got a, a, a long sales cycle with two large 
um, corporates. Um, it, it allows a company like Indico to really come in and um, showcase how how great of a partner, how valuable they can be. Um, that's my take. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And, and maybe adding to that, I mean, this is a classic innovator's dilemma, right? That um, having done this multiple times now for a long time, um, there's two things that no longer scare me as an early stage CEO. One is a better financed competitor, and the other is a massively resourced public company, right? Who who wants to 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 compete in the space? They, they have different challenges, but I'll, I'll I'll tell you the take is that let's start with a big public company, you know, which has you know fifty thousand employees and and uh, billions in revenue. So, in more than one occasion. Um, Companies like those have approached Indico to acquire us, and the the, the pitch has basically gone like this: either sell to us, uh, or we're just going to build what you have and 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 wipe you out. Um, and that just doesn't strike me as credible in my experience. Because if we take the big company for a second, what I'll say to them is, okay, understand that we have n number of employees who get up every morning and care nothing about, about anything other than solving this particular problem we've identified as valuable in the market. And by the way, we we see it earlier than the market has. So we're already ahead. Um, and, and, you know, so that's, you're gonna, you can't catch up that fast because we've already had more, what I like to call at bats, right? Mm -hmm. You can't accelerate at bats with, with just money. And so unless you're telling me that you're about to put 200 people on this project and they're going to think about nothing but this problem for the next five years, you cannot catch up to us. Um, I don't care if you're, you know, a multi-billion dollar uh, uh, public company. And that's been, I've seen that over and over again. That's been true every time. In fact, both those companies that that sort of, you know, made that back alley uh, uh, promise to me, neither of them uh, uh, have have competed with us in, in, a, in a significant way. Um, on the other hand, you know, better financed earlier stage companies uh, money is also not just the answer, right? You you have to you have to have a very strong view on the market. You have to understand where your competitive differentiators are. You have to develop better sales craft. None of those things are really dictated by money. You need money to do them ultimately, but money doesn't doesn't cause you to be better at them. So um, I think that that's why this is a, such a fun game, right? Which is um, anybody can try. Uh, and it doesn't mean that if you don't have as much capital or as many employees or as many customers, you're you're doomed to failure. It certainly stacks the deck against you, but you're not doomed to failure because of that. I think one of the one of the things that the advent of GPT has shown me is that answering the question is not the most interesting thing. It's finding the right question to ask. And I think that's part of what you're scratching at there, Tom. Yeah, I think that's true. Um and this is look. This is something that humans are really good at, and probably will will be better than machines for a very, very long time. Um, answering the questions it, clearly, we we've seen a shocking advancement in uh, uh, in AI's ability to, to to do that, as represented by its understanding of how humans would answer those questions. And that's an important that's an important point regarding GPT that maybe we should spend five minutes on later in, in the discussion here, um, because there's a bunch of asterisks next to that point for sure. <laughs> Um, but you know the the create the creative process of of predicting where a market's going, understanding and anticipating what customers are likely to need because of that market shift, articulating that to the customers in a way that they understand how it connects to their problems, and then doing the trillion things you need to do in terms of execution to get there, hire the right people, price the product the right way, market it the right way, all those things. So that's why it's both. Fascinating and really difficult to to build a, a a successful disruptive you know new company. Chris touched on it, but and you don't have to name names or, or name them if you do. Were are any surprises in the report to you, Tom, of, of companies that were there or weren't there that you come that Indico comes across or that yeah. is just familiar names? I'll tell you what, I was more surprised by the companies that have fallen backwards, which I I had perceived were. We're doing better, um, and in along you know whatever attribute it was, uh, you know whether it's customer growth or, or or strength of vision, strength of execution. Um, it's a crowded market, right? I think anybody who reads these reports, especially the IDP report, less so the unstructured, the IDP report 
it's a crowded market. And, and by the way, that report only probably lists, I don't know, 20% of the, of the total vendors playing in that space. It's a crowded market, but it's a relatively undifferentiated market. I think the number one complaint we hear from prospects is it's really hard to, to, to tell everybody apart who's really good at what um, the marketing seems similar. Um, and that, that's where you can get at some of the commoditized uh, segments of the market, like, like invoices and things like that, which are just, you know, there's hundreds of startups uh, focused on invoices, which which is a head scratcher to me, but but nonetheless, it continues to attract startups. One of the things that stood out to me in reading the report was um, in on their, you know, Harvey Ball chart where they talk about market impact and vision and capability. Uh, Indico was, was the only company there that got... Um, you know, full marks for the value delivered category. Um, we'd just love to hear your thoughts on on why that is, um, and you know what's what the company has done to date to to you th- that you think gets them to that kind of unique positioning against all these other companies. Yeah, this is sort of you know hard hard won on our part in terms of just you know lessons learned in the field. I think the strength of of Indico where where you you get that uh, sort of uh, uh rating by the analyst we've become really good at helping the customers start with outcomes and work backwards towards solution a lot of times what happens when you engage with a prospect especially with you know we deal with very large very smart very well resourced prospects um the challenge with that is a lot of the time they come to the conversation with the the answer, right? We have this problem and we need to solve this way. So can you do that? And we'll say, well, wait a minute. Are you sure that's, are you sure you're asking the right questions here to, to get to that outcome? Maybe we should start back with a better definition of what, what is the, the, the most valuable outcome you're trying to achieve? And then let, let's really talk about possible ways to get there rather than starting with the answer. Um, I think that's worked really, really well for us. And um, it causes all of us, both the prospect and Indico, um, to be super outcome focused, uh, which which I equate to value, right? So the outcome is the value. And so it's not just the large language model architecture. It's not just our, uh, you know, award-winning user interface. Um, it's also how we help customers think through the very real change management that has to come from any investment in automation or AI. And a lot of times that's that's missed in the process, which is what, what will you have to do differently as a customer tomorrow after you have Indico or any any vendor like Indico than you were doing today? And is your team ready for that? Are they going to lean into that or are they going to fight that? Um, and look, I think in the in the world of enterprise software, more, more often than not, you know, the, the people who are actually going to end up using the technology aren't brought into the loop and end up fighting it. Um, and so we really want to draw that to the surface and make sure that that's been considered, you know, before we even talk about you know, artificial intelligence or machine learning or any of those kind of things. This is one of the themes of this podcast, which is how human automation ends up being. And yeah. uh, it's like anything you change someone's tools or their work day. Um, they're going to be upset about it. You have to, you have to anticipate those things. Um, What's funny is when, you know, when we do a good job, Fast forward, you know, a year later, and you know, you couldn't pry it out of their hands, right? Because they they have made the mental adjustment, you know, uh, that the the solution is brought to the table, and now they can't live without it. So, I think that is a there's sort of a mini, you know, kind of S curve that all the customers go through when they implement Indico or any technology, which is there's you know heightened expectations, trough of disillusionment, and then plateau of productivity. And preparing the customer for that uh, it, it helps inoculate it from the project, you know, dying right and during that that trough where everyone's like, oh, we have to do something different. We have to change the way we work. Um, and so, you know, really helping them think through that is important. Yep. Um, changing topics slightly, uh, knowing that this report is going to be read by prospects, current clients, um, potential investors. Uh, it's a very thorough report, like hands, you know, hats off to Everest. They did a great yeah, job. Agreed. What do you what do you think could have been more explicit and more helpful uh, for that for those audiences out there? I, I think the parts I just mentioned, I think a lot of time um, that is is given the short change a little bit. I think there's 
a, a, an understandable uh, tendency to focus on feature function, you know, uh, business model, things like that, all, all important. Uh, but but I think not losing sight of as a buyer, these are things you're going to have to consider independent of whatever you know whatever solution you select. Um, I, I think. You see it, like the the Everest and and other analysts will come out with with research on this from time to time. But I think that that's an important piece of the of the of the equation. Absolutely. Now I'm going to circle it back to Chris's favorite topic, um, Chat GPT and generative AI, and the hype peak that we are in. Um, you know, I, we we talk about the arrival of, of Chat GPT is it's. Every, everyone's hyping it up. It's it's having its moment. Um, does does this newfound popularity, I'll call it, um, in your mind, help or hurt um, Indico when when you're talking to prospective customers or when there's potential to be listed in reports like this? Yeah, I think the way I think about generative AI is it's a new programming language. I think that's the the right way to think about it. I think there's a tendency in the market right now to think about it as a Swiss army knife of applications that can solve everything. Um, and, and ChatGPT is like, not to take anything away from, from ChatGPT, I think if you've used it, it's jaw dropping, right? It really, we are at a, a real inflection point, but it really is a new programming language. The, the disruption here is two things. One, um, you can program it with data for the first time, right? Rather than having to give it instructions in a syntax it understands, you know, C sharp or Python or whatever, you can use data to 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 guide it. The second is the 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 syntax you use also is English. Um, I say English, and I, and I I do that deliberately um, for this reason because some, sometimes people have corrected me and say or French or Spanish or Italian. I'm like, well, hang on, let's let's pay attention to how GPT was trained, right? GPT is trained by consuming digital information on the internet. The internet is about 85% English. So be careful thinking that GPT is going to work just as well in all those languages when the training data available is vastly smaller and gets very small very quickly, right? As you go out into the long tail. Spoiler so, alert, it definitely doesn't. Right, <laughs> it does not. So um, there's a billion and a half uh, uh, English language speakers on, on the planet. Um, conceivably, they're all suddenly GPT programmers, right? Uh, compared to there's about 25 million software engineers in the world. Uh, so just to give you a, a sense of the scale of this potential impact. Um, so I think that every software company in the world is suddenly having to step back and look at the moats that it thought it had with proprietary you know, software, um, because a lot of that software now is going to be um, very easily replicated with generative AI. Uh, so it cuts both ways. It also means that features that were previously out of reach are suddenly very much in, in reach. So for Indico, the benefit for Indico with generative AI is we built our entire application around a premise of large language models as the disruption. So the cloud LLMs, OpenAI, Llama, all these different cloud LLMs are just yet another flavor of that, another programming language that we put into the application and can take advantage of. So in the short term, there's a lot of sort of churn and maybe confusion and maybe a little overhyped expectations about what you can do just with, with Gen AI. But ultimately in the enterprise, you're gonna to have to think about how to safely, securely and scalably take advantage of this new technology. I, I love the point about GPT being a programming language. I think this is where everyone always wanted to go, right? No one actually wanted to write assembly code. Um, people, you know, uh, programmers would prefer to learn Python over C, right? Uh, and this is a natural evolution there. Right. Um, coming back to the, I want to make two points. One, I think that means the role of product in technology companies becomes infinitely more important. Back to my earlier point about finding the problem, the question to ask is more the important. The right question, yeah. And, you know, you have a long product background. So I, I wonder what your what your take is on the future of product roles given GPT? I think that product has always been about thinking through the, the art of the possible. Um, and then, again, to my, my earlier point about thinking about outcomes and then working backwards, right? Um, now, that that doesn't mean that that the technical side of the house doesn't bring 
uh, a sort of disruptive ideas to the table either. That absolutely happens and should happen in both directions. But but product's primary job is is the art of the possible. Um, asking that th those questions, what would really transform the customers, you know, slash users' experience, and then that the relationship with with engineering is really about clever ways to do that in a way that's cost effective and scalable and reliable and you know all, all the things you need. Um, so yeah, I think that's right. I think that as the the barriers to executing some of these ideas drop with generative AI. The, the the clever questions become even more important. Yeah. Uh, the other the other question I wanted to ask, and maybe this will be where we wrap things up, is um, because of GPT and how easy it is for people to see how powerful these technologies can be, Unstructured is having, obviously, a moment in the sun. Now, while I think Everest did a great job in separating out Unstructured into its own report, that's also you know, that's a, a year in the past of research, right? So it doesn't fully absorb the impact of the way the market has changed because of GPT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you think this matrix looks the next time around? Specifically- Take the, out the crystal ball, Tom. Take out yeah, the, crystal the crystal ball. ball. I think next year, we're going to see an the analysts in general um, connecting this much more to a bigger so what question, right? So. Clearly, all, we we all can intuit the value of of transforming unstructured into structured, right? Most of the enterprise platforms in existence um, assume you're going to feed them structure, right? And when you don't, you, it's like putting you know gas in a diesel engine. <laughs> um, but there's still a bigger so what? Like, how do you use that to gain a competitive advantage beyond the obvious? Um, and that's something very much much that Indico is working on. I'm not going to reveal all our, our uh, secrets on, on, on unstructured, uh, unlocked here. Uh, but, but I think that we're both trying to contribute to that story with the analysts um, and also, you know, write that story ourselves. which is, I do think there's a bigger, so what around the corner next year that we're going to be talking about a lot more. Can you reveal like what you think maybe the, so what is? I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Not yet. I think we're working on it. So I, I only say that because I think we're we're still developing uh, our our updated narrative as to you know where this goes next. You know, from a again, uh, and, and this isn't about necessarily product feature function or or technology innovations. It's it's more about you know it, it really is from the customer's perspective. So what? You know, yeah. okay, now I can do this. What what's what's next? Why am I suddenly more competitive? Yeah, M Michelle and I recently recorded an episode with um, Avi Koltari from Everest, and I asked the same question, like, which large language model use cases are going to stick in the enterprise? And uh, I got the usual answer. It depends. No, no one knows <laughs> right now. Um, no. And I thought it was interesting that the advice that they're giving to folks in the enterprise is to experiment widely, like try a lot of different things. Yeah. Uh, which is... I, I, which is not very natural for large enterprise companies. So I found that fascinating. There's a bit of a risk too, right? Which is, again, it it, it takes away from, well, make sure you have a, a particular business outcome you're trying to solve for yeah. um, and not just try to use Gen AI for the sake of using Gen AI. You know, I think that that that's an understandable uh, risk that we're going to go through for the next six months. And, and And I get it, right? But I think by the end of this year, people will stop trying to justify using Gen AI for its own sake. And by the way, like this happened five years ago with AI, um, exact same exact same cycle that everyone was was urgently trying to, to be sure they were using AI. But, you know, sometimes that misses the question is, well, should you be using AI for problem X or Y? Mm -hmm. And we learned, we learned right over the past few years that some of them were just not feasible or not, 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 um, you know, desirable to use AI. Or there are already other tools that existed. Like th this was the thing with crypto, right? Like you already have databases. You're fine. You don't have right. to use tokens to solve this. Well, and it's the, is the technology exists to make it better or just to add a technology layer to something you're already solving? Right? Yeah, I think metaverse, blockchain, you know, those are cautionary tales here. Um, I do think Gen AI is, is far more um, useful in the near term in, in a tangible way than either of those technologies. Um, but they're, they're cautionary tales. 
No, and I, I agree. And I think that comes back to your analogy with a programming language. Like the world is bought into the fact that programming languages are useful. Yeah. And the most useful ones are the ones that allow the most people to write the most code the fastest. Right. Well, Tom, we'll have to have you back to do the big reveal of if your so what um, is the right so what in the future. Um, yes. But in the meantime, uh, thank you for joining us for the special 25th episode of Unstructured Unlock. I'm co-host Michelle Govea, joined by Chris Wells shaking his Indico pom-pom um, and special guest uh, CEO of Indico, Tom Wild. Thanks, everyone. I'm honored to be here for the big two five. So thanks, guys. We'll see you again at 50, maybe. All right. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>